Hi, good morning, everyone. Today's session is on managing continuous organisational improvement. Um, and my name is Shazia Khan. Uh, the learning outcome today that we'll be doing is learning outcome two, uh, which is to be able to analyse opportunities for improvements to organisational activities. Before I go into learning outcome two, I want to just give you a recap of the last learning outcome we did. Uh, which was learning outcome one. In learning outcome one on the unit on managing continuous organisational improvement, we looked at understanding how organisations create a culture of continuous improvement and acceptance of change. We went on to look at um, describing the features of organisational culture that encourages and allow for continuous improvement we looked at analysing approaches that facilitate the introduction and acceptance of organisational change. We then went on to look at evaluating different approaches to quality improvement, uh, one and one to evaluate um, leadership and management styles and to assess the importance of continuous improvement in supporting organisational success. Uh, we looked at um, the different types of organisational features, uh, business culture, business structure. We looked at input from employees. We looked at communication structures, uh, an element of um, one or two way communication. We also looked at communication with stakeholders, uh, role of governance and legal requirements. We then went on to look at leadership and management roles. Um, within an organisation and we looked at uh, the consul consultative, democratic, autocratic, laissez-faire, pioneer um, and then we looked at different management styles and how it gave you examples with reference to that. We looked at supporting communication, so team meetings, discussion groups, um, acceptance of risk. We also looked at uh, collaboration between working um team work and learning and seeking feedback how why that's so important within an organization to get feedback uh, we looked at shared values uh, goals beliefs strategy and we looked at um, how the learning is incorporated into practice so how there's an encouragement of having new ideas in place uh, information systems to support learning and knowledge management um, and investing in staff development, why that's so important for an organisation and why there's a need to invest in staff development. We then went on to look at continuous quality improvement, so top, bot, down, bottom up. We looked at academics such as Cotter and Schlesner, um, which looked at education and communication participation and involvement. We also looked at elements of um, the organisational culture, why it's so important with regards to any organisation and the characteristics of organisational cultures, such as stability, team orientation, attention to detail, etc. We then went on to look at contrasting organisational cultures, so organisation A uh, compared to organisational B. We looked at um, different types of suggestions for changing culture. So, you know, replacing unwritten norms, uh, reward systems. We looked at uh, Levin's three-step change model, so unfreezing, moving and refreezing. We then went on to look at elements of uh, resistance to change, why there's individual resistance, such as maybe it may be the security, fear of the unknown, um, it may be their habit. We looked at effective leadership and management roles. We looked at the directing leader, the coaching leader, the supporting leader, the delegating leader. We looked at what quality meant in regards to an organisation and why that's so important within any organisation. We then went on to look at uh, quality gurus such as Armand and uh, Fegman, Philip Crosby, uh, Karo Ishikawa, um, we looked at the PDCA model cycle uh, from Deming. We looked at the six stigma in regards to elements of how a process uh, deviates from perfection. We looked at the black belts and green belts and what they meant within an organisational structure. So the black belt meaning the project leader, um, the 
master belt, black belt is a teacher, mentor. And then we looked at um, the green belt being the uh, project team members. We looked at the Six Stigma DIMAC, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, control, and looked at TQM in service total, total, total quality management in service companies and why that was so important. We then went on to look at quality attributes in service, uh, benchmarking best level of quality achievement, timelessness. We looked at cost of quality, uh, so the cost of poor quality, cost of achieving good quality and external failure costs. We looked at what IOS, ISO 9000 was, um, so quality management system uh, defines fundamental terms and definitions. We looked at IOS, ISO 9001, which is standard to accessibility for customer satisfaction, and then IOS 9004, which was guidance for a company on continual improvement of its quality management systems. Um, we also looked at the element of why these procedures are put into place and why there's a need for these. So these were learning outcome um, one. Now we're going on to learning outcome two, which looks at elements of um, being able to analyze and improve uh, uh, for improvement to organizational culture. So learning outcome two is being, being able to analyse opportunities for improvement to organisational culture. 2.1 is to analyse sources of information used by organisations which help to identify the improvements needed. 2.2, explain big data and evaluates contribution to organisational improvement strategies. 2.2M1 is review information to identify areas for improvement in a named organisation. And 2D1 is evaluate the potential benefits of proposed changes to organisational activities in a named organisation. So the indicative content. So, so we'll be looking at sources of information for learning outcome one. This is the indicative content for learning outcome two, sorry. Uh, sources of information, environmental audits, political, legal, economic, social, technological, uh, environmental, and it's the pests. Pestle analysis, we look at organizational analysis, strengths and weaknesses in organization, internal management accounts, standard costing, um, monitoring of organizational activities and suggestion schemes, benchmarking, external audits, feedback from stakeholders, including appraisals, PDR complaints, analyzing information, reliability of the source of information, and how widespread is a specific problem. So we'll look at systematic errors versus one-off errors, use of external uh, consultants, criteria to select for improvements. Um, we look at the impact strate strategic fit, what will change with the organizations, for example, systems, people, procedures, resources, etc. cetera. Time scales of change as well, why that's so important with the organization. Resources required implementing change and investment analysis. <clears throat> we'll also look at big data, four dimensions, the volume, the variety, uh, the velocity and veracity, uh, different types of data, text machine, um, generated audit, Twitter, internal um, internet, sensory techniques, uh, for an organization, we look at stages of analysis. So we'll look at things like checking, cleaning, sorting, modeling, mining, characteristics analysis, technological changes, for example, memory storage, space, physical location, and the scope of the data. We'll also look at the evaluation, which we look at stakeholders. Who will the improvement change affect? How will they affect, be affected and why? You know, we'll look at that. We'll look at the achievement of business objectives um, and how these will affect stakeholders. We'll also go into looking at cost-benefit analysis and why that's so important within any organisation um, and why uh, taking into account the business objectives because that's the element that we need to look at and how that would affect um, individuals and stakeholders. 
So learning outcome to be able to analyze opportunities for improvement to organizational change. Gibson et al. pointed out organizational effectiveness is dependent on internal and external factors. For instance, like we said, technology, structure, process, work, culture. You know, we need to continuously be improving um, our approach uh, and, you know, meeting the organizational uh, goals uh, for increasing the intellect profits and, you know, reducing costs. Um, uh, organizations that recognize that they have to try to make these uh, opportunities for improvements need to make these opportunities to create this organizational culture. Um, and, you know, we're going to look at that in more detail. So PEST. So the organization may con conduct any sort of element of uh, a PESTLE uh, to assess the need for improvement. Um, and this is literally a framework or a tool uh, used by marketers uh, to analyze and monitor the macro environmental, which is external uh, marketing environmental factors and the impact on the organization. So it looks at elements of that, what challenges they have, uh, and also looks at any sort of changes that can be made in regards to that. So PESTEL stands for Political economic, social, technological, environmental, legal and ethical, which is something that's new being added onto it. And the elements of that is going through elements of that, which we look at um, the issues around that in regards to what that impacts on. So in regards to PESTEL, the first one we've got is political factors, which is um, how and what degree a government intervenes in the economy. Uh, this can include things like government policy, political stability or instability in overseas market, foreign trade policy, tax policy. It could be things like labour laws, environmental laws, trade restrictions. Uh, so it's, it goes on, the list goes on for political factors. The next one is economic factors, which have a significant impact on how organisations uh, do business and how profitability they are. So factors they can include things like economic growth, interest rates, uh, rates, exchange rates, um, inflation, disposable income. Um, so these factors are, you know, can be looked at in the element of uh, identifying um, how, how profitable the business is. Then uh, I think the next one, social uh, factors. Um, are also known as social cultural factors and they are areas that shared belief and attitudes of the population so these include things like uh, population growth um, age distribution health consciousness career and and attitudes and so on and these factors are of particular interest as they have direct effect on how marketers understand customers and what drives them then we've got the technological factors or changes that can come about um, and may affect the marketing and the management in three different distinct ways, you know, so the technological landscape changes. And it could be things like new ways of uh, producing goods and services. It could be new ways of distributing goods and services. It could be new ways of communicating with target markets. And then we have environmental factors. Um, which are really only come to the forefront of the last 15 years. They're important uh, due to the scarcity of like raw materials and things. Um, and it could be pollution, it could be uh, ethical and sustainable issues, carbon footprint targets. Uh, these are just some issues that marketers may be facing um, that need to be taken into account. Legal factors include things like health and safety, um, equality, opportunities, advertising standards, consumer rights uh, and laws and product liability uh, and a safety of products as well is really important when it comes to this. Um, and the, it's a legal requirement that companies must follow this. And the last one, which is the final one that is, is quite new, is ethical. And this is uh, a new, most recent addition to the PESTLE. 
um, and it is um, stands for ethical and includes ethical principles, moral or ethical problems that may arise in a business. So it can consider things like fair trade, slavery acts and child labour um, or CSR, which is corporate social responsibility. Um, and it could be big brands often taking CSR, which is corporate social responsibility. Some examples are uh, things like Innocence Big Knit Campaign, uh, creating hats for the drinks to raise money for Age UK, a McDonald's youth programme to provide pre-employment training and uh, development, and Barclays Digital Eagles to provide training and development on coding and information on digital skills. So these are some of the um, corporate social responsibilities put in place. So that's PESTEL. Now we're going to look at strategic capabilities. So strategic capability is really important in regards to elements of you know, an, any organisation. And it's a mix of knowledge, skills, tools, processes and behaviours that combine and deliver any sort of organisational objectives. Um, Analyzing how strategic capabilities might provide value and sustainability is looking at the VR VRIO process, which is um, an element of um, looking at value, rarity, uh, immutability, and organization. It's a, it's a business analysis framework for strategic management and it uh, evaluates all the sort of resources and capabilities of a firm. And it was proposed in 1991 by someone called Jay Barney. And it helps, it literally helps uh, organisations evaluate how, how their resources contribute to market positioning. And resources are highly valuable, rare, imitable, and they are organised to use. So, and we'll contribute most of the market positions so uh, they are sure they need to make sure that they are following the VRO, VRIO um, framework uh, to help them uh, look and identify any sort of elements of resources long-term resources sustainability um, and consider any sort of uh, developing strategic capabilities so the strategic capabilities, uh, what are strategic capabilities? How do, uh, this is a, a, an element of how we'll go through it, the key issues. How do strategic capabilities contribute to competitive advantage and superior performance? Look at how to dis diagnose strategic capabilities and how to manage the development of strategic capabilities. Resource-based management. So a resource-based uh, view um, is a strategy method that focuses on actual resources of a company. Um, and it looks at, uh, rather than studying external factors, trends or deficiency, uh, this method, uh, it highlights what a company has, its resources and defines an action uh, framework based on it. And it looks at, sometimes calls it the capabilities review, uh, review as well. It looks at whether the resources a company has are more coherent, easy to develop, and are more realistic as well. And it's um, it looks at elements of you know um, you know sometimes it looks at psychological uh, elements, uh, and it it looks it brings in you know when you use the resource based view. It brings in the method of PESTEL as well in this and also the VRI analysis. So an example would be um, of a resource-based uh, view example is uh, Lecker <clears throat> cameras, uh, which was found in 1869 in Germany. Uh, and its history has seen loads of technological changes that have left many camera companies behind and looked at how they survived as well and what alternatives they used. Uh, and they developed new digital cameras as well. So LECO is an example of a research-based, resource-based strategy.
resources and competencies, uh, strategic capabilities, are the capabilities of individual organization of an organization that contribute to its long term survival or competitive advantage. So resources, like we said, are the assets of any organization and what we have and the competencies are the ways that asserts assets are used and deployed effectively and what we do well. Competences of strategic um, capabilities. So this diagram identifies resources, what we have, uh, machines, buildings, raw materials, products, patents, balance sheet, cash flow, managers, employees. So each element has its physical, financial, human, and then we look at the competencies. What do we do well? So for, for physical, for machines, we look at ways of achieving utilization of plant, efficiency, productivity, and then for financial side, ability to raise funds, and financial cash flows, and then for the people side of it, how people gain and experience competencies. So these looks at long term survival and competitive advantage. And you know, resources, as we said, are business assets, capabilities, and are the ability to exploit it. You know, and they are an important part of any organization. You know, you, there's a need all the time. It's one of the core competencies of a, a business and an organization. What resources are in place and what uh, capabilities are in place for future survival. Example they've given here of um, elements of that is the IKEA example. So external um, example IKEA, external environment analysis might provide the understanding about the need for change to organizations, but organizations might have to look inward to assess whether it has the ability and resources to respond to how it can capitalize on its strengths. Organizations may use standard costing to assess how well it is doing and may revisit to rationalize its operation in order to achieve higher profit margins. Uh, this may, without looking at external environment, but as a matter of policy or vision, for instance, IKEA strives uh, for low price irrespective of the geographical regions. However, assessment of organizational activities cost may require continuous monitoring because some activities might be consuming higher resources than required. 2.2, 2. explain big data and evaluation in its contribution to continuous organizational um, improvement. So big data is a combination of structured, uh, semi-structured, unstructured data that organizations uh, collect, analyze, and use so the element of that you know they use that um in regards to identifying uh, any sort of um structures and information and insights it's used in machine learning projects predictive modeling and other advanced analytical systems around and it was um according to sas big data structural unstructured data organized insights for better decisions uh for business moves uh, knowledge, uh, Hope 2006 added semi structures as third type of data, usually pertaining to a business, and the structured data comprised of data stored in structural form, for instance, contact details of IKEA's customers, suppliers, inventory, employees, etc. Unstructured data comprised of unstructured information, which may be generated through Twitter, Facebook, emails, and semi structured is keywords arranged on a semi-structured manner um, and, you know, identifying how it's used. Companies use big data um, in their systems to improve operational efficiency, provide any sort of customer service and uh, create personalised marketing campaigns and take other actions that can increase revenue and profits. Businesses that use big data effectively hold a potential competitive advantage over those that don't because they're able to make faster and more informed business decisions. For example, big data provides valuable insights into customers that companies can use to refine their marketing, advertising and promotions to increase customer engagement and conversion rates. Both historical and real-time data can be analyzed to assess the evolving preferences of consumers 
or corporate buyers enabling any sort of businesses to become more responsive to, to customers' wants and needs. Um, some examples of how organisations in various industries use big data. So for oil and gas companies, a big data is used to identify potential drilling locations and monitor pipeline operations. Um, and for financial services, big data systems are used for risk management and real-time analysis. For manufacturing and transporting companies, another example, uh, companies rely on big data to manage their supply and chains. And government agencies use uh, big data for emergency responses, such as things like crime prevention and smart initiatives as well. So the four dimensions of big data are the volume, uh, variety, uh, you have veracity and velocity. So looking at the element of a variety is the fact you've got, um, we base our decisions today on prescriptive data obtained through this method. So it's like uh, every customer's competitors will generate prescriptive data that ranges from structured and easily managed data to unstructured information that is difficult to use for decision making. And then we've got uh, veracity, and this refers both to data quality and availability. So when it comes to things like traditional business analytics, the source of data is going to be much smaller in both quantity and variety. Um, then we've got uh, velocity, uh, and it's very possible that variety and veracity would not be so relevant and would not be under so much pressure when facing big data initiative. Uh, the data uh, will be an input of technology area and an output in regards to uh, decisions and reactions. And then we've got volume as well, which is the amount of data. Um, you may have heard more than one occasion that big data is nothing more than a business intelligence. Uh, big data needs a, amount, a certain amount of data, but having a huge amount of data does not necessarily mean they are working on the field of data. So these are the four main dimensions of big data. So I've gone through each one, so you've got a bit of a better idea. So volume, like I said, it uses cases of commercial aircraft generates 3 GB of flight sensor data in one hour. Some examples of that, uh, velocity, speed at which the data is created, so stored and analyzed. Um, variety is refers to sources and types of data. And then variability refers to the biases, noises, abnormalities, ambiguities, and latency, and the other important two views of data, validity and what volatility. 2M1. Review of information of IKEA identify areas of improvement. So Shapira pointed data analysis is not the goal in itself, but it's done to assist business to make better decisions, making data better, enabling data-driven uh, decisions by every department at every level. Therefore, a value of chain is created under which data is automatically collected, cleaned, analysed, and information is delivered with, with predictions. When we look at IKEA, so IKEA... Um, is works with more than 1,600 direct suppliers spread across the globe, ensuring these suppliers quality and compliance essential to maintain the commitments of IKEA. Uh, and it's into workings of IKEA audit and Stefano Bizarro was the senior sustainable IKEA who identified his business and identified the um, uh, approaches of how to element, identify IKEA's vision. IKEA's vision is to deliver low uh, home furnishing products with quality through a simplified and cost-effective manner. And that was identified in 2018 and what their vision is, what they intend to do. So create their vision is to cre create a better everyday life for many people. To achieve this, IKEA was established in 1800 suppliers worldwide, encouraging its do-it-yourself concept to reduce any sort of transportation 
inventory and assembly cost. However, after Brexit, IKEA is exporting cost-effective material, for instance, bamboo. IKEA at present is heavily dependent on wood and may, it may adversely impact IKEA in the coming year at times because of the growing cost and concern for environment. Um, however, bamboo-based, uh, home-based product is, t is thought of East for instance, China, India, because there are abundant availability of raw materials and bamboo is used for centuries. IKEA has entered uh, China during 1990s and but soon realized its products are considered to uh, be costlier. It has to develop local supply chain and introduce products matching local taste along with setting up stores near public transportation facility. In memo stated 2017, the point of having indirect presence and supply from India, IKEA is planning and set up 25 stores. However, IKEA may face similar challenges in India, but bamboo-based product may be a recipe for developed national nation and it may not be a special product for Chinese and Indians. On the other hand, growing prices of wood and environmental concerns in common for developed emerging nations that government have launched bamboo-based mission and Mamen 2017 pointed out that IKEA is aiming to increase the bamboo-based product sharing from existing 1% of its total sales work workforce. Evaluate 2D1, evaluate of potential benefits of proposed changes to IKEA's activities. So IKEA, by making India as a sourcing hub for bamboo and local wood, may create employment for employees directly and indirectly. Further, by investing on stores as planned, may provide employment for Indian experts from, experts from EU and new challenges. Being an emerging nation, India may act as a sale booster for IKEA because of the growing middle class and relatively younger nation that develop nations. Government may provide assistance to IKEA for setting up supply chain and stores, for instance, lands at cheaper rates, mediating between local artisans, farmers and uh, IKEA. Shareholders may get higher returns because of increased sale in India. Employers in other countries may accept bamboo as a challenge to be promoted and there may be resistance among employees because of redundancy. They may not be willing to uh, hard to sell at stores. Shareholders may be worried about this, making such a huge investment in case expected benefits not achieved. Existing suppliers, especially in China and Eastern EU, may not like this idea and they may go with competition or start competing directly with IKEA. So these are the, some of the references we've used for elements of uh, this part of the um, this part of the slides, okay? So Shapiro, Memon, these are academic sources that we've referred to that you can go onto the links and have a look at these as well. Backup slides to help with learning outcome two. What is environment? So we looked at elements of what is environmental auditing and why it's so important in regards to organization. So environmental auditing is a systematic, documented, periodical and objective process in assessing an organization's activities and services in relation to assessing compliance with relevant statutory and internal requirements, facilitating management control of environmental practices. An environmental audit is core to any organization as it evaluates the organization's environmental performance. Environmental audits can be done on specific procedures and operation areas to assess the effectiveness and compliance with environmental rules. And they are there to ensure that organizations and companies do what they are, can to preserve their environment. Environmental auditing is used to investigate, understand and identify, and they are used to help improve human activities with the aim of reducing adverse effects of activities on the environment. Um, environmental audits um, aim to accomplish numerous goals from a broader point of view. Uh, these audits assess the company's uh, environmental impact and it can also look at elements of, it can show managerial teams what they can do to improve their environment, sustain it and prove with the environmental processes put into place and how they impact on positivity affecting things like you know productivity or efficiency and if there's any risks to find from the environmental audits and they are really crucial 
uh, in any organization uh, in standardizing compliance measures across the organization uh, and making sure that companies can understand where training is needed and where there's the right uh, control systems in place. Uh, it also, they can determine whether the company has adequate streams of communication in regard to environmental compliance and make sure that they are, you know, complying with the um, regulations that are put in place and make sure that they're complying with any sort of uh, laws that are put in place. Auditing, another important element of any sort of organisation. Um, auditing is... Um, is to do with the financial side of it is a review and verification of your financial documents which shows that you know there are uh, elements of legal um compliance in place so you know the term audit its origins are financial and the international chamber of commerce icc produced a definition in 1989 which is a management tool comprising systematic documented periodical and environmental eval evaluation of how well environmental organization management and equipment are performing the aim of helping to safeguard the environment by facilitating management control of practices and in assessing compliance with company policies, which will include regulatory um, requirements and standards applicable. And environmental auditing is carried out when development is uh, already in place and is used to check on existing practices, establishing the environmental effects of that. So it's really important in an organisation when we look at auditing to make sure we look at the financial side of it, examine the financial statements and give a true and fair financial position of the organisation. Um, and the main purpose is to ensure that compliance with laws and regulations are put in place to help maintain any sort of accurate and timely financial reporting and data collection. So it's really important for any organisation. Distinction between environmental reviews and an environmental review and an environmental audit. So as we said, the environmental audit is, um, is there to collect objective audit evidence to compare specific compliance requirements, uh, which an auditor will do. And an environmental audit is form, it's a similar approach and it's for the purpose to demonstrate compliance with specific regulatory requirements. So the status of a regulated compliance may be very important to buyers and you know elements of uh, customers out there. So this table identifies the difference between a review and the audit. So what is the subjective? So for review is to determine which performance standards should be met. And for an audit is to verify performance against their standards. Um, and then what which environment issues are covered? So for a review, all known environmental issues with or without explicit standards to measure performance and for audit only issue for which standards exist for example regulatory requirements internal company standards or good management practice but how often are they required so for the review before developing environmental management systems or before and after any significant changes in operations or practices and for an order audit regularly or on a pre-planned cycle basis for a review, what are the geographic boundaries? So wherever the business could have an environmental impact in the life of product, raw material selection, transportation, etc. And for an audit, usually well-defined geographical boundaries, for example, the limited the, to the site, companies uh, or local planning authority. Distinction between... Um, financial audit and um, environmental audits. So financial audits, uh, the legal basis is part of regulatory process. Um, organizations are here to perform it. And for an environmental, um, just gonna increase it a little bit. For the environmental one with exceptional exceptions, environmental audits are voluntary affairs. And then for the frequency for financial audits is annual affairs for environmental whenever the organization decides to perform one who does it for the financial audits it's the performed by external staff certified to do this 
and for environmental audits it's performed by external or internal staff professional indemnity considerations there are no legal requirements of auditors to be competent or trained although professional bodies in many countries try to stop this methodology for financial audits are based on comparative standards which are publicly available general principles of accounting for environmental audits you've got varies very much between auditors and companies for financial audits the access to audit the results are public documents in the form of annual reports for environmental audits uh, with very few audits are public although some results are often published in environmental reports the liability for financial auditors are partially liable for their reports they have to provide a true and fair view of the organization for environmental audits with few exceptions, they are negotiated between auditor and auditee. There's no external liability and explanation implication in environmental audits. And then you've got uh, the element of um, the, uh, there's a quiz there for you to have a look at. So we've looked at um, the element of uh, financial audits and environmental audits um, and looked at uh, the importance of this within an organisation. So, you know, why there's a need to have it. Um, and, you know, all businesses uh, have to evaluate their businesses, their financial audit and their environmental audit. And there's an importance, these diagrams, both in page, uh, in distinction between environmental review and environmental review and distinction between financial audits and environmental review, identify where there's a need for it, uh, legal basis of it, who needs to do it, when they need to do it. So there's a quiz here that you need to look at in your own time. And there's also, I've put in there, sorry, uh, just share that again. Sorry about that. So there's a quiz there that you need to look at in your own time, which looks at elements of um, uh, business external environments. And also I've put an article there with a the video. It has, has got a video in it that you can refer to. And it, it's an article on continuous improvement within any sort of organisation. Uh, we've finished learning outcome uh, two now, and these are some of the recommended reading. Just to give you a brief overview of what we've been through in learning outcome two, so you've got a better idea. We've looked at being able to analyze opportunities to uh, for imp improvement to organizational activities. Uh, we've looked at analyzing sources of information used to identify the improvements needed. We looked at um, the PESTEL um, analysis and how that is used within any sort of organization, why there's a need to have that in place as well. We've looked at social, economic, um, and uh, social, economic and technological changes and political changes within regards to an organization and how they impact on any organization. We looked at elements of strategic capabilities and we looked at and evidence uh, looked at the VRI, VRIO uh, analysis on looking at value, rarity, intimacy and organizational support and why that's important in regards to strategic capabilities. We looked at elements of um, resource-based uh, strategy and looked at the resource-based review uh, view and gave some examples of that and why that's so important for capability in regards to identifying the strategy of an organisation. We looked at resources and competences. We also looked at competence of strategic capabilities. We looked at the example that we've given in regards to the which was IKEA and what their vision is and what they aim to do in regards to bamboo uh, uh, because the costing of wood. And we looked at the four dimensions of big data. We looked at what big data is, what are the four dimensions of big data, uh, things like variety, veracity, velocity and volume and why there's a need to have each one in elements. We also went on to look at 2M1, which was reviewing the information of IKEA to identify areas for any sort of improvements. And we looked at uh, the benefits of proposed changes to IKEA's activities. Uh, and we looked at some backup slides, slides which looked at environmental auditing, why that's so important within an organization. We looked at what auditing is within um, elements of an organization. And it refers to more, when we look at auditing is the financial sector. 
we then went on to look at the distinction between an environmental review and an environmental audit uh, within a diagram and identify what the objectives were, which environment issues are covered and things like how often and what the geographical boundaries are. We looked at distinction between financial audits and environmental audits and we looked at uh, the legal basis of the audit in a, in a diagram and the frequency, uh, who does it, methodology and the access to audit and who's liable for it. So we looked at that in a diagram form as well and identified that. Um, and I have put an article on there that you can refer to and there is a video on that article that you can read around elements of continuous improvement opportunities for improvement for organisations. So these again are the recommended reading that you could go on. I've just given you a summary of what we've done in today's session. And also if you um, want to have a read of any of the articles, some of the additional reading is available on Moodle for you. This um, recording will be available on Moodle for you for extra, uh, if you want to listen to it, but also uh, there's additional information on Moodle around this area. And also um, if you have any questions, please email learnerwork at ukvarsity.co.uk. Thank you for attending today's session and the next session we'll be doing is learning outcome three. Thank you.